Okay, so chapters 11 and 12, we are, I'm not going to call it the home stretch, um, though we only have a, a few more chapters to go, but perhaps we are headed into the climax. Perhaps we are headed into the end game because after these last couple of days of seemingly endless debate, something very significant has changed. And what's that? Ransom understands that Medallia is really there helping him. Yes, Melville is definitely there. Melville. And, but he's not helping him in the sense of through further debate. Something about the, 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 the stakes and the confrontation has been clarified into its most raw form. He realizes he's going to have to confront the unman, and not only that, fight him physically. Yes. It's the spiritual stuff that's going on, which it is too. Absolutely. But, so but Ransom has got to take action. In such a cosmic and spiritual story, it has come down to a nail and fist and foot. Not even weapons and tools. Um, so as most of you, if not all of you know, my boys wrestle and there is something innately pure about the sport that I really admire that ultimately it's just you and it's just this other wrestler and there's no ball and there's no stick or bat there's really nothing. It's just the two of you and it's strength on strength and will on will. And for a two minute period, it's just maximum physical effort. And what I get out of this is there's no swords. There's no sticks, there's no shields, there's definitely no guns. This is just, you know, Ransom is naked. And it is just raw human physicality. And there's almost nothing more base than that. Yeah. I get the impression that Ransom has been called into a savior world. He is supposed, he is supposed, he is attempting, he has been attempting to verbally fight with evil. Yes. And try to influence the green lady. And so right. I, I think that's, I think that, and I think even he feels that that's his role. Yes. He, he, that, that's what he feels he's been called to do. Sure. And it makes a lot of sense. Remember um, the what might have been considered coincidental, but we would see as providential, him being kidnapped to Malacandra in the last book, and it actually equipped a human to learn old solar because they didn't just kidnap any old person, they, they kidnapped a, a, a language expert. And so, um, I think it makes perfect sense that this, you know, this scholar yeah. and this, this, uh, this language expert assumes that it will be his mind. It will be his intellectual skills. It will be his linguistic knowledge. Um, that will be the reason for his presence on Paralandra and his role, um, against the dark and terrible spiritual forces. But also his faith. Well, yeah, absolutely. Certainly his, certainly his faith. But everything is very intangible in a sense. 
everything is very internal. Um, and, you know, we, we've, we've mentioned this a, a few times that, uh, you know, going back to our, uh, going back to our St. Paul, but that, um, you know, our battle is not against flesh and blood, but against the spiritual forces. And so many times Ransom, I think, has seen this and has been, I think, appropriately so. Um, we've had, a, you know, several chapters worth of this engagement. And sometimes Ransom seems to get the better of it. And sometimes Ransom doesn't. And sometimes he feels ill-equipped. And sometimes he feels like he has granted exactly what he needs to say at that moment. So in chapter 11, let's kind of go back and think through what, what changes. And how does he get to the change of how this has gone from our battle is not against flesh and blood to basically our battle is flesh and blood. Well, he, for one thing, said the enemy is here. Where is Malachi? Okay. And then finally he realizes that he's there. Right. And That's he, right. He begins, and Ransom begins to argue with himself. Well, he, 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 he's concluded that he hasn't been successful trying to win the battle by debate. Sure. And he looks around and says, well, what do I have left? And it's only a physical encounter. That's right. Yeah. The only thing left is his body. Um, he also realizes that the unmanned body is really ransom. Or not ransom, Weston. Yes. Now, again, this is, uh, you know, to, to, to tease out a little bit of the, of, the, of the technical stuff about this, um, it is not, it is no longer Weston in the sense of his, his soul and body have been, have been split, which seems to be irrevocable. Um, his soul is certainly no longer in control of his own body, but ultimately he has been under the assumption, and I think maybe all of us have been, that there is something supernaturally strong yeah. about the unmanned. He has been supernaturally possessed. Of that, there is zero question. But every horror movie has prepared us that this, this, this supernatural monster, this zombie or whatever that we used to know as a friend or as a colleague or at least as a person, now seems to exhibit supernatural strength as well as supernatural ability. I mean, he definitely has supernatural abil ability even before he was completely possessed. Remember that, that Weston, Weston became fluent and old solar through the power of the devil. He was able to do things that he couldn't do before. And so Weston assumed, and I think maybe all of us did, that there's, there's something so monstrous about the unmanned that maybe we expected it to be also monstrously powerful. But ultimately, it's still Weston's body. And Weston was a dumpy intellectual, you know? Probably he was built larger, more physically imposing than Ransom, but he wasn't in good shape. And he was probably real puffy and doughy and, you know, probably would have trouble going up more than a couple flights of stairs without catching his breath. And so, you know, when we get into a deep in chapter 12, it's actually a way more even fight than Ransom would have assumed. And that's probably part of the reason why he never considered this would be a physical contest. What, what, what could he do against a demonically powered body. Well, and the fingers too. Uh, and, uh, Weston's fingers. Uh, right, he's already right. seen those 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 long, creepy, sharp nails tear apart little animals. Yeah, that's scary. So there's already something just really unnerving about him. Well, that's that's almost a tool that he has, whereas Ransom has nothing like that. Exactly true. Yes. Well, I think. Ransom entered into this, this uh, encounter with, uh, with really a lack of confidence in his 
uh, in his ability to succeed. Yes. But the very thing that, that Marion said, he was overwhelmed by the uh, uh, clause, whatever other uh, strengths that the, uh, the uh, enemy had. Yes. But I don't think, I don't think he expected to win. No. He, he's going into it like, oh, well, this is the last resort. I'll do my best. Well, and, and it's interesting because from the beginning, from the beginning of the book, really, Ransom has known that this endeavor may result in his death. And he's been okay with it. He's been willing to answer the call and go where he is sent. But he was kind of resigned. Even when he's talking to Lewis in the beginning about taking care of his affairs and all this kind of stuff, he's like, you know, it's likely I won't be back and I, you know, I'm not gonna leave you anything in case they investigate you for murder and remember all this stuff where he was pretty matter of fact that I may not survive, but I'm going to go anyway and do my best. What's so interesting about that though is I think in all of the ways that Ransom assumed he may die, he never would have guessed wrestling another human and certainly not, not Weston. Like, you know, think, think about the ways he could have died in Malacandra. There was the there was the creature, the Nakra, that could have killed him. He the Sorns before he realized who they were, he thought maybe he's going to be sacrificed in some ritual. Uh, Weston and Divine had a gun, and they could have just shot him. And as a matter of fact, he had found the knife and he had prepared. I was going to fight potentially to the death. Um, but that at no point did a sense of like just this raw physical with every ounce of strength I have contest. It just never enters into his mind, I don't think, until it has to because there's nothing left. So probably the key moment comes fairly early in chapter 11 where he is frustrated and worried that he can see the seeds of thought being planted. And even though he's, he's you know, mostly countered the unmanned arguments at every turn, he feels like he's always losing just a little bit of ground. So what's the problem with that? Even if, so she's not fallen. The green lady has not fallen. She has resisted temptation to this point. What's the problem? Why not just continue? The idea that's what he's afraid of. There is an idea that now seems planted. A crack in her. There's quite possibly a crack. So, so what's the, what what conclusion does he come to because of that? He he feels he may lost. I don't think he believes he's lost yet. He has to take care of it now before something does happen with that's her. Right. That's I think the, the 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 dividing line is, this can't continue. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. can't go. This on. can't. I, the longer this goes, I will lose. Well, yes, he, he's sensing that, that she is gradually uh, wavering. Yes. And uh, he can, can see looking ahead that, oh my, she's, she's going to give in. Well, and, and, and at some point, even losing just a tiny bit of ground over a few days, though that might seem like, like a success because she has not fallen, when will this ever end? The unman seems to need no sustenance. He needs no rest. He could continue this on indefinitely. Maybe he could continue it on forever. What happens in a week? What happens in a month? What happens in a year? What happens in a thousand years? How many of these debates, even with incremental tiny pushes of the green lady, at some point, he can see the writing on the wall. This has got to stop. And if it doesn't, there's no way to win. He has that conversation about his name, Ransom. I want to get to that in a second, because okay, it's, it's, that, it's, that, it's truly that, beautiful. Very telling. <laughs> so uh, he's angry, in a sense, in the beginning of 11, because he is understanding how unfair all of this is. It feels like he's fighting, not just with one arm tied behind his back, but with everything tied behind his back. The devil gets a miracle, in a sense, of having Weston there and possessed. What has Malelville done? 
yeah. he doesn't think he's done anything. He, he, that really runs through his head. He's, I think he's he's very frustrated and, and, and maybe even slightly indignant. He's doing his best. Why won't Melville support him since he's one of them in the first place? He, he even thinks about giving up and repenting later. That's also very telling. There, this comes up on, on several occasions that um, the thought enters and he entertains it in several ways. Well, maybe, maybe it wouldn't be such a loss if I lose. And then, you know, St. Peter lost. St. Peter succumbed to temptation at the crucifixion of all times. And it was after the resurrection and he was, he was redeemed, forgiven, and restored. So, you know, worse comes to worse. I can still be forgiven after the fact. And that starts to grow. And then he starts to entertain the notion, well, maybe that was a plan all along, just to do my best. My best was never going to win, but I'm demonstrating this great faithfulness by this noble failure. Mm -hmm. and it's like the longer he talks about it, not only the more plausible it becomes, he starts seeing it as almost obvious. Well, of course, I, I could have never won this. Melville has clearly sent me here, you know, to, to, to observe, to record, to do my best, of course, but then to go back to earth and to explain what I've seen and on and on and on. And, and, and he's all got this kind of wrapped up in a neat little bow. So then what happened? Well, the one thing that I wondered about as he leaves to go to find the unmanned and he goes deeper and deeper into the woods and he finds the green lady sleeping. Yes. And he stops to admire her. Yes. And I, I couldn't understand, was he back in an earthly admiration desiring her or? All right, well, let's, let's get to that in just a second. I'll say, just so I don't forget, no, it is not, there's, no, there's nothing what we would consider carnal about his admiration. There, there, was, a, there was a real purity about it. Um, well, that, that's what I was thinking, that he was just admiring her for her yes. motherliness and perfectness. So uh, let me, I, I do want to go back because I want us to talk just a little bit more about the process of, of coming back around to knowing what he needs to do. But, but, but Mary's moment here, I think it is so substantially significant. I don't want to lose track. Um, if you have ever faced a mortal danger, and I don't mean like which of us has stormed a machine gun post, but I mean like you went onto an endeavor, maybe it was a major surgery, or something. And there came a moment, like a point of no return that was coming up and you kind of had to be okay with it. Um, you had to be okay with never waking up. You had to be okay with, um, this might be it. Um, there is a very, it's very interesting, almost surreal, time of hyper aware appreciation of life you start thinking about very simple things and how precious they are people uh maybe even like just the the, the, the miracle of your body and your hands and thinking about you know very very basic fundamental things and you become extremely aware of your own self and your own life and your own body in a way that you weren't beforehand. And it's almost like a, like a final reflection, um, whether it's psychological or a spiritual gift, uh, this just kind of heightened awareness about your own life and your own body. I think that's what is happening with Ransom. He knows he is going off to his death and he sees what he's fighting for in its beauty, in its fullness, 
in its innocence, in its capacity of life. And I think he has to admire her in her physical form, but not in a sexualized way as though he desires her carnally, but just more of like seeing the depth of beauty as it's intended to be seen. As in, present paradise. He, he, he sees the moment of, of, of present in paradise and it's like, I just want to write this on my mind for a moment before I go off and perhaps die. I think that's what that is. And, he, and if he lingers over it for a moment, it's not purient. I think it's more that hyper awareness of the preciousness of life and just how, how poignant all of this is. And now that he's done that, he can take his deep breath, he can exhale, he can leave it behind, and he can step out into his own end. Because I fully believe that's what he expects at this point. I, uh, so, so going back to that, I, I think he's come to this conclusion and it's been a really tough one to get to. And, and, and part of it, you could, you could see his own mind fighting to come up with every excuse why this was not just a bad idea, but the wrong idea to fight the unmanned physically. Everything from who do you think you are that you would somehow be chosen by God to be in some mythological contest against the personification of evil. I mean, that's you're, you're over aggrandizing yourself and that's just silly. Two, well, I'm, you know, I've got these puny arms and I'm not much of a body and there's no way I could win. Why would he do this? I mean, he just kind of goes on and on with every reason. And one by one, they are exposed as, as himself resisting. Every excuse he can come up with, every time it comes up, starts off completely plausible. But it takes almost nothing for him to realize this is not about plausibility. Because the plausibility, you poke it just once and it's like, uh, like cardboard, it falls right over. Um, we've heard the, the sermon joke about the, the guy whose home is caught in a rising flood and he climbs up on the roof and he's like, God, God, help me, help me. And the guy comes by in a boat. Come on in. No, no, no. God's going to help me. And the guy goes, another boat. No, no, no. God's going to help me. And the guy comes in a helicopter. And like, no, no, no. God's going to help me. And then the guy dies and he gets to heaven. He's like, what the heck, God? And God said, what are you talking about? I sent you two boats in a helicopter. <laughs> so the joke is with everything stripped away, Maleldil does have a miracle to contest the devil. And that miracle is Ransom himself. And it's not prideful and it's not humble to talk in those terms. It's just simply true. When this book began, it might not even been this book. It might've been the last one. I'm not, I don't remember when the last one ended. I, I told you something that you probably don't remember. I told you that the end of the first book has a, uh, it's a, it's a literary device where he says that, you know, basically all the names were changed to protect the innocent, but this is actually a true story. And now it's your turn to go spread the word. Um, but it's like Ellen Ransom is a pseudonym because he's a real guy and I don't want him to get in trouble. Well, that literary device is forgotten at this point. So we're just, we just kind of pretend like that never happened because Elwin Ransom is very clearly this man's true and given name. And when, when the voice out of the darkness says, my name is also Ransom, yeah. I get a catch in my throat every yeah. time I read it. Yeah, yeah. 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 For he has given his life as a ransom for me. Yeah. So ransom as a language expert knows good and well that there is a very simple and humdrum explanation for 
the history of his last name and it's related in, in a way that it, that it has absolutely nothing to do with the concept of, of, of what we would call ransom. Um, in, in literary terms or in linguistic terms, there's such a thing as a false cognate. And a false cognate is a word in another language that looks so similar to a word in your own language, you assume it's the same thing or that they must be related, but they're not. It just, it's kind of coincidental. Um, there's a bunch of them in Spanish, none of which are popping into my head at this second, but you, you think for proof positive, uh, you know what it means, but you're wrong because, um, because it doesn't. It, um, it just so happens that it, it's, 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 uh, they're not related. It's like a, um, a homophone. It sounds the same, but it means something totally different. Um, and, and he's never associated his own name with the, the, the term of ransom as though the cost paid to free a captive. And at this moment, if he sees all of the threads for just a glimpse. Um, occasionally I will, I will mention in a sermon, there are no coincidences. There are just those blessed opportunities where we see connections that are always there within the will of God. This is the tapestry that's a beautiful image on the front. You look on the back and you see all the crisscrosses of threads that you could have never, you could have never imagined how such a mess could, could, could come back together and to, to have something so orderly and so beautiful and so patterned. And for just a moment, he feels outside of his own life to know that past, present, and future, that's, it, it just so happens to be where he is. It's, it's an accident of his being, but it's not true reality. True reality is all of this at once within the palm of God's hand. And even deep within his family's past, it, the name of Randolph's son was attached to this family because this descendant upon descendant upon descendant would one day be on Venus and for this moment. And um, he just has this kind of amazing moment. It's fleeting, but it, it's, it's, it's powerful of realization of God's will. And it's, it's like, uh, I, I think this is roughly within the stream where he mentions uh, he would never again he, be able to hear the debates about free will and predestination in the same way. It all kind of falls away when he is given this God's eye view for just a fleeting second of reality. But that's enough for him to see his place in it. It's both completely insignificant and also supremely irreplaceably important. And it's all at the same time. Because if he fails, God's will will not fail and Paralandra will be redeemed. If he succeeds, then something precious is truly protected. But it's not, none of this is a fait accompli in that sense where he should just throw up his hands and say, well, you know, whatever. Uh, that's again, a, a sermon joke about the, uh, the, uh, the Calvinist theologian who falls down the stairs and he gets up and he says, well, I'm glad that's over with, right? But I'm bummed. 
you know, the predestination, I was always predestined to fall down the stairs. And I'm glad now that that's finally over with. It's a joke. But what he's saying is it is up to him and in this moment. And it, it genuinely is up to Ransom himself and his physical body and this contest of flesh and will. And if he does not succeed, Paralandra will fall. If Paralandra falls, it will still be God will redeem it. But that which is precious and unique will still be lost. It ought to both be a sense of great humility and encouragement all at the same time. Everything rises and falls on him and nothing rises and falls on him. I have a question yeah. that's been running through my mind through all of this. And maybe this is too early to ask it, but is this trilogy possibly his walk in coming to Christ? Hmm. Um, you know, I've never had to think through that. And you don't need to answer it, but that's been running through my mind through especially this book. Yeah. And maybe maybe it'll be answered toward the end and maybe it won't. But you know, um, I, I I would say I would say no in a formal sense, but you know, C.S. Lewis's conversion is such a profound part of his testimony, and it so influences everything that he does. You have to assume that elements of this echo all through it. And and one of them I'll tell you right now. And this is very much a part of his conversion story. Ransom, and this is also through this discussion in the darkness, sees and is reminded of the convergence of myth and truth and story and, you know, the, the, the Greek and Roman myths. And, and there's, there's, a, there's a reality connected to it. And oh, this... One of the reasons he, he, he says, well, I can't possibly physically fight the young man. What am I, you know, you know, in some Greek mythological battle and all that stuff. But wait a second, I've just seen these stories that kind of echo in the world and in nature and in humanity itself are actually connected in some way to things that are true and real and eternal. And so that was an element that was an intellectual element that was extremely powerful for Lewis during his own conversion story. He loved mm -hmm. old myths. He, uh, the Greek and Roman myths, the Scandinavian myths, the, 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 the Middle Eastern myths. I mean, he was, he was huge on understanding these, these cultural stories. And that's what a lot of his professional expertise was on, especially in the English language. Um, and I, I think Tolkien was one of the guys who helped him see that um, by calling Christianity a myth, you haven't done anything other than make it more compelling because the technical definition of a myth is different than our kind of standard random definition we think myth and we think it's a it's a it's fiction but that's not the definition of a myth a definition of a myth is a story intended to explain how the world operates that's true. And, it, true. and it can be fictitious and what really hits lewis in the heart especially about the truth of scripture is being confronted with well why wouldn't God use story and myth to explain who he is and what we are? And one fundamental myth that is true, that every other myth is simply a shadowy echo of. That Christianity is the true myth. It is the true story which explains the nature of the world. And then all of these other 
you know, myths throughout civilization and cultures and stuff like that. Those are the echoes um, where all of creation proclaims the glory of God, where Romans chapter one, every culture within their conscience hears the voice of God in some particular way and has fallen short of that. Um, and so this concept of the myth being true or the mythological story being connected to a heavenly reality, even if it's kind of garbled in translation, I think has been extremely important to Lewis in his own life and specifically in his conversion story. Does that answer anything, Marion? Yes. <laughs> it kind of fortifies what I'm thinking. Yeah. Um, but it's not of importance in any real sense, but it just kept occurring to me that that's possibly what has happened here. And, and especially when he comes to the point of accepting that this is his choice right. to follow and do what he believes God wants, or Delia wants him to do. Um, and he just does his best and we're yet to find out what that best will be. Right. Um, it, but this has been a real opening of him. Uh, I'm, I am reminded of a different scene and from the first book where as he basically stands trial for humanity and in front of Oyarsa, just basically like, just lays it all out to the point of even saying, it's probably better that you kill us all so that we do not corrupt the, the beauty and the innocence of this, of this planet of yours. He lays it all down to Malel Dill by the end of this conversation and what little he was holding back without realizing it, the, the, the physical confrontation. Exactly. How he even accepted that. And he goes forward fully expecting to die. He thinks very little of his physical ability and he is terrified of the young man. And he hasn't yet experienced Madelda giving him those powers to overcome. Well, and, and I don't know if I'm saying that correctly, but he's promised no power to overcome. Pardon? He has not promised a single power to overcome. He is no, he, he, he isn't. But he's in reality told. of life, if you're doing what God wants you to do, he gives you the ability to do it, even though you may not think you have those abilities. Yes. And, and usually you only recognize it post-experience. That's exactly right. You, you typically only see that capacity after it's been demonstrated. Um, this is First Thessalonians 5 kind of stuff. That to which he has, he has called you, he will equip you and accomplish it through you. Um, but what either Ransom might have hoped for, and he gets the, I think the pretty clear understanding that's not happening is that he is going to get some kind of extra supernatural boost to his ability to fight. He is. Yeah, well, he does in chapter 12 to a certain extent. I think it's communicated to him. No, I have already equipped you that those stringy arms of yours, that's what you have needed. And that's all you will have to take with you. Uh, mm -hmm. And he does. He, he, he goes off now. He is granted this one gift, and it's a real interesting one. And he said, he is told, I have cast your enemy into sleep. So he's given these last few moments to kind of prepare himself, to steal himself, to maybe take a last look. Um, and, uh, you know, the unman, the body of Weston is for the first time inactive and asleep because before remember this this body powered by the devil needed no sleep so uh weston takes this as an opportunity you know kind of cleans up and gets the last breakfast and you know you can almost see the condemned man preparing himself and and that's where we get mary into this looking at the green lady and i think it's just more of a kind of a poignant last look um however there is some the, the, the sexual connotation to it, I will say, is 
by seeing in her nakedness the, the, the heavenly perfect beauty. It will influence what he thinks about the female form from there on out. And by that, I think we're back again to the echoes of what we heard very early on where he talks of um, where he's, he's very sideways in a conversation with another theologian about the resurrection. And, and, the, and the guy's like, whoa, well, you'd be very frustrated to be resurrected with genitals if you never use them. And, and Wes was like, ugh, you don't understand. You're, you're kind of past all that. It's not that you can't. It's you have no need, no interest. And so I think he has now seen everything in the female form that the human mind might in its in its fallen nature not be able to see innocently but he's been reminded one last time of how innocent and perfect beauty ought to be because your sister sleeps also yes your sister sleeps also um Well, and he's trying to keep that from happening. So um, this, the neat thing is by the green lady sleeping, his, and, 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 and what, a, what a lovely statement, your sister is sleeping. And it, and it just kind of brings it all back home. But everything is at peace and asleep, even the animals. Yes. And yes. there is this purpose of what is to happen next, Paralandra, even the creatures and it, almost like the, 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 the nature itself will be spared the horrors of knowing what this, what the ugliness of this fight will be. Um, you know, the, the, the green lady was fascinated by Ransom's skinned knee early on. I mean, can you imagine the damage done to innocence by seeing the terrible brutality of an unarmed fight to the death. Um, and again, remember that Ransom fully and completely expects to die. He goes in assuming that in the same way that Weston's animated body needs no sleep or food, that he will be fighting against something that is given extra strength and ability. And he will, he will go down swinging but he fully expects to go down. Uh oh, we just lost the stewards. Let's hang on for a second and see if they sign back on. Um, so we are, um, we're, we're about to get to the meat of, of this and there, we've got some stuff to say. So I wanna, I want to make sure they can get back on if possible. Aha, here we go. Okay, she's been able to sign back on. As soon as it kind of registers, we should be okay again. All right, you guys are back? We're back. Okay, good. All right, so we, we held off because we have to talk about the real heart of this chapter. And I'm just going to read it because it's worth it. What page? I'm on page 130. And you think, little one, it answered, that you can fight with me? You think he will help you, perhaps? Many thought that. I've known him longer than you, little one. They all think he's going to help them. Till they come to their senses, screaming recantations too late in the middle of a fire, moldering in concentration camps, writhing under saws, gibbering in mad houses or nailed to crosses. Could he help himself? And the creature suddenly threw back its head and cried in a voice so loud that it seemed the golden sky roof must break. Eloi, Eloi, 
Lama Sadakani. This is how the contest begins. Ransom just goes and clocks him. And from that moment, shocked and surprised, this is the devil's answer. You must think that God's going to help you somehow. That would be the only reason you would dare try something so futile. Well, too bad for you. And just how eerie. I've known him far longer than you. Everyone thinks he's going to help. I know what happened. And I've seen it all. I've seen it all. And I've heard them screaming and crying, assuming he would show up and he never did. And... It is truly a diabolical moment. And if there was any power left in the unman to use his words rather than his body, this was the coup de grace. To cut right at the heart of what, what, of, of what ransom has left. You are a fool because you trusted in a God who has sent you to die, will not show, and doesn't care. So the great thing about this is Ransom's way past that. He knows who he's dealing with. Now there is a there is a kind of a an amazing uh, realization that what he hears from the last words of Christ, it occurs to him, he is hearing, human ears are now hearing what no human ear has heard in 2000 years, that he believes it wasn't just, uh, just perfect Aramaic being spoken, but it was a perfect recording of a memory where he was there. And if there was anything else that needed to be said or understood before this pitched battle actually went to its fullest, any doubts or illusions about who he was up against, there's final confirmation. And so they fight. And the shocking realization from Ransom is, I might be able to do this. He is not supernaturally powered. I mean, it's disturbing. It's awful because he's, he, he's fighting not like a man. He's fighting, again, like something controlled. No, no, no man would fight the way that Weston is fighting because of self-preservation, because of pain because of you know, stimulus and response. But ultimately, it is still the exact same muscle tissue that Weston always had. There is nothing monstrously strong. He's not been granted some supernatural power to pick up 10 tons or he's no, he's no super villain. It's still a doughy academics body. Um, and so they, 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 there's this rawness to the, to the, to the contest. I, it's worth at least just a moment of realization. Um, how, what is Ransom's goal in the sense of how does he win? Start simply, and then let's let's look at it for a second. How how does ransom win this? Like what 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 is the what is the what's the finish line for him in this contest? How not how does he win strategy? I mean, what is what would constitute a victory for ransom? The death of the uh, enemy. Okay, 
So that's it. That's all there is. Okay, Weston has the, the body of Weston has to die. It is the only thing holding the malicious spirit of the devil onto Malacandra. That body must be destroyed. Now, in thinking of the details, he only has his bare hands. How do you kill a resisting person with nothing? Will. To it's going to take will for sure, but it's going to take more than will. Power. He will have to pummel him into pulp, or he will have to choke him until he has not even asphyxiated him. I'm not completely sure that Weston breathes. He would have to, I'm not sure what physically dismember him the 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 finality of how you defeat this animated body is kind of almost too difficult to process and i don't think at this point we really know how no or he I'm, not, I'm not even sure he has a plan other than he's just got to he has to destroy him he pummels him, he try, he breaks a, every bone that he can. Yes. And, and I don't think he realizes at this point, it may be I'm jumping the gun, but I believe that Vidalia is uh, assisting him by having all of the bones break so that he will eventually become nothing. I'm not going to say that's impossible, but I'm going to say I don't think that's what's happening. Well, I'm I have to read that this is, book, so I don't know. I think this is, I mean, so as someone who has spent some time in learning how to affect another human body in ways that human body does not wish to be affected, um, the breaking of bones, even barehanded, even untrained is quite possible, but it's enormously violent, enormous, shockingly violent. Um, some bones break and it, they're actually pretty easy to do. Um, uh, anyone off the street could break someone else's fingers, their collarbone, probably an, or an orbital socket, break some ribs. Um, but what he is vaguely prepared to do is just, it's enormous in its scope, but he gives everything he has to this. He, when it's up to more of a, more of a boxing, punching, striking, he's got a huge advantage whenever possible. The unmanned just grabs him and grapples where you can use his size and bulk and those sharp, sharp fingernails to just tear and rip and pull. Uh, they, they bit. It's just, it's there. This is like this animalistic. No holds barred. Boy, no holds barred. We think no holds barred and we're not thinking this. Um, but there's also this kind of very interesting thing that happens. And whether this is a gift from Melville or just a realization that happens, there is a moment that begins and then it floods over everything. And Ransom now discovers, perhaps from the first time, hatred. the pure and genuine use of hatred. We cannot speak about hatred in the way that he is experiencing. Why? It's there, it's there. the energy that he felt, the hatred, turned to joy. Yes. I can't imagine. How, how could hatred turn to joy? Well, for him, I would assume it's because he he feels that he's doing his best and doing what Medallia wanted him to do. And he might possibly accomplish 
the destruction of evil. Yes. And therefore preserve Perilund or... That's, that's, yeah, I, think, I think you're absolutely right. He is now in a face-to-face, -face, no hold part contest against evil, capital E, evil. And for the very first time in his life, he's not talking about an evil man. He's not talking about evil actions or, you know, someone, that, uh, gosh, whose line is this? Um, uh, it's definitely not my line, but, but it's not, he talks about the line between good and evil is not the it's not the one that we're worried about about the separating people from another. It's the line of evil that runs through every human heart. He is not talking about someone who has been corrupted, someone who has made terrible choices, someone who is innately selfish, someone who is even diabolical. But this is the pure and personification of evil in which there is no light whatsoever, and for the very first time, genuine hatred can be expressed without sin. As Jesus clears the temple in anger, but does not sin. It also made me think of Old Testament when the Lord or when God would give um, the armies the power to destroy when they were much weaker. Yeah. There is something enormously energizing and powerful about doing the right thing when 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 you're in the middle of whatever endeavor it is and it just you get this maybe a moment of clarity like yes i wasn't completely sure but right now yes and you just feel you feel more excited you feel more energized you feel more capable and imagine that and i don't think it's I, i'm i'm, I'm going to suggest it's not so much a supernatural gift like like Melville zaps him with extra power, it's more of a natural consequence of being in a state of affairs that he could not have put himself in because there's no way to face true evil on earth. True evil does not exist in a way to grab and punch and pull on earth because it's always manifest within another broken person just as you are broken. That's not to say that every person is equally good and bad. It's just to say that there's always, there's always some element. There's always some hope. There's always some possibility of forgiveness or redemption, or, you know, even when we must destroy an enemy, this is, uh, uh, this is the midrash where, uh, Moses stops the people from singing, um, after the song of Miriam, when, the riders of Egypt are lost in the Red Sea. They, they, they speak the, the words of triumph, but they don't celebrate because it was God's children who were also killed. Um, and so what happens if that's totally off the table? What happens when we say no holds barred, but we mean it in a way that we've never experienced? He is given this strength but i think it's the strength of the clarity of purpose that has never been so clear before in his life that there is only evil and there is nothing to hold back from there is no he's, he's not worried about the unmanned feelings he's not worried about he's not worried about the unmanned potential redemption one day this is his only goal is its destruction and that destruction is truly right um to be angry without sin and now to hate in its genuine created purpose untainted by human brokenness gives him a sense of clarity and purpose he couldn't even imagine he had still left inside of him. And he fights the unmanned, you know, more powerfully than he ever could have hoped to the point where, how does the chapter end? 
young man leaves. He runs away. He runs away. The devil is afraid. As a matter of fact, it even shocks Ransom. That it kind of comes out of the like, what just happened? You know, this, he was, you know, he was gonna die, and, and all of a sudden he has run from me. He wasn't ready for that. And so the unman screams and runs and finds a fish, gets on a fish and takes off. Ransom, well, what do you do? You gotta catch him. You gotta catch him. It's on. It's on. There's no there, you don't stop this. There is no way to stop this. And the contest is so pure and so necessary and so right and so final, it can't be stopped. It mustn't be stopped no matter what. One of the things that I tell, did I just lose my mom? All right, well, she, maybe she's having a problem. Um, Marion, when you guys, did you guys get knocked off just randomly or did something happen? No, I turned my phone off, but I had an 800 number come in on the uh, iPad uh -huh. and I I tried to disconnect the phone calls uh -huh. I don't know if it brings okay. in and it, it knocked us off. All right. I wasn't sure if there was something about my Zoom connection because now my mom's dropped off and we're going to give her a minute to see if she can get back on. Um, While we're waiting, yeah. the thought that comes to me as this happens, that that's exactly the point of one who is a non-believer to a non-believer realizing or coming to, to God and accepting Jesus as their savior. They know that they have to destroy or we know that we have to destroy everything there is about evil. It doesn't happen right at that moment, but it's something that you strive to do through your Christian walk. Sure, sure, but we do that towards the evil itself, not really towards the person, with the hope exactly. that it may exactly. be drawn out of them like poison. But, but, but what happens when you're faced with just the poison? And I think that's where we are with this. It's like the poison has been drawn out and all that's left is the evil itself that, that brooks no quarter. You, you, it just has to be destroyed. It has to be fought utterly, fully, and completely to the end. Um, and I don't know. If in I'm the end, it really never comes until not. death. Right. Well, and and but that's what they're facing now because one or both of them are going to die. That is the only way this can end. And it's one of the things I was going to say before my mom dropped off, and I'll just go ahead and get into it. Um, within the martial art that I teach, it's a defensive art. And so it's, it's, I'm always saying, you know, it's about making things better, not making things worse, about turning the temperature down, not turning it up. You know, if the most peaceable solution is that well-timed punch or kick, but then it's, it's about making it better. Um, and so we do very little grappling, but we do train with a little bit of grappling. And one of them is with these grapples, these techniques that they learn, you, you grab the person, especially they grab you first, but one of the things I've told them is, once you grab them, you finish. And the techniques are intended, they, you know, they happen like in a series, like there's 10 moves or something. And once you grab them, there's a few of them where you actually release one hand to do something, but you have the other hand, you still on them. And if you have to release that hand too, you have to re-grab them with the, with the first hand before you can let go. Because once you grab someone, this is the principle, once you grab them, it's on. And it cannot be turned off. The only way to turn it off is to finish. Because the problem is, once you grab someone, it is by its nature so provocative, you can't talk your way out of it at that, at that point. Once you've actually grabbed someone who has been physical towards you, if you let go, you will be putting yourself at, a, at an extremely dangerous risk. The only time that you're allowed to let go is when it's safe for you to do so. And it may mean they're incapacity. But you don't, once you start, 
And so that's what he's done. He's grabbed. And so the young man runs. I've got to, I've got to chase him. And so sure enough, he finds a fish too. And there's this kind of blazing realization as though he was, you know, the, release the hounds. And he's going to chase him down. And almost all of Paralandrin nature seems to be with him at that moment. And he feels connected to the heavenly realms and to the cosmos and to the universe and all of nature and all of God's will and all the future, all the history, all the story. And he's at like this nexus point right there as he's chasing the unman with a determination that even him running is not going to end this. This will only end when evil is truly defeated. And that's where our chapter is. So yeah, cliffhanger for sure. Um, so as far as I am thinking, um, we've got five chapters left. If we do 13 and 14 next week, that leaves 15, 16, and 17. I cannot fathom us doing 15 and 16 and waiting an extra week just to do one last chapter. So I'm assuming that we will do three chapters at some point. Um, unless you guys tell me, oh, no, no, I want to let this linger as long as possible. We'll do 13 and 14 for next Wednesday, and then we will do all the rest when we get back. Now, I, I, gosh, I got to check on a calendar. I might be causing a problem for myself. Yes, I have clergy conference on the 20th, which would be our last class. So I can't be here on that Wednesday. I can be here next Wednesday and I can be here the Wednesday after the next one. So the 13th and the 27th, but I can't do the 20th. Does that impact how we want to do these last couple of classes? You want to just take the two weeks to finish those last three chapters? Sure. Okay. So for next Wednesday, we will do 13 and 14, and we'll be in the home stretch. And then the 27th, we'll do the other three. On the 27th, we'll do the last three. Okay. All right. We good? We're good. Good. All right. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.